First of all, I'd like to thank Nicosi for the opportunity to share with you what we've been learning. Hello everyone, my name's Mary Sharp and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Reward Foundation, Love, Sex and the Internet. We're a relationship and sex education charity based in Scotland. The topic for today is a review of the research on online pornography and its impact on the brain and sexual offending. I'm covering this from the Scots Law perspective, but much of the content is relevant everywhere. I'm also looking at the more serious crimes rather than sexting or revenge porn, though that's not to diminish the impact they can have. As we know, pornography today is nothing like pornography of the past. Thanks to technology, there's now easy, anonymous and free access available 24 seven on multiple devices to an enormous variety of pornographic content and from any location. The smartphone is the most commonly used device to access pornography. Around 70% of porn is accessed by the very convenient smartphone. So let's start with some stats on internet pornography use. We're living in a changed environment from 15 years ago, certainly. And Pornhub, the most well-known, receives over 115 million visits per day, and there are other large consolidation sites to choose from too. In one year alone, 2019, 169 years worth of porn was uploaded to Pornhub. How many people use it? Well, since a decade ago, lifetime prevalence of pornography use has increased by 41% in men and 55% in women between the ages of 18 and 25, with consumption now around 92 to 98% in men and 50 to 91% in women. The heaviest users are young men aged under 35, and 20 to 30% of users are children. Pornography use went up 11% during COVID, helped no doubt by Pornhub generously making their premium content available for free around the world. Now, according to a 2010 paper by Bridges and colleagues that did a content analysis of the 50 most popular videos at that time, the main types of violence seen were gagging with a penis, so that is forcing it repeatedly to the back of the throat, choking or sexual strangulation, and we'll look at that in more detail later. Rough anal sex, ejaculation on the face, spitting on the face, anus to mouth interactions, so that's anal sex followed by oral sex, hair pulling, verbal abuse, and racial abuse. 94% of recipients of violence were women, and importantly, 95% of the violence was received neutrally or with pleasure. Basically, porn performers consent or they don't get paid. Now think about what that means for young people learning about sex through pornography. They don't see any consent negotiated. The dominant partner, usually the man, always gets his way. And popular genre of porn today include very young teen porn, incest themes, gang bangs, torture porn, rape porn, and so on and it has become much more violent in recent years. So what effect does such a huge amount and variety of pornography have on the brain? Next, we're going to have a short video that's an excerpt from a longer documentary made for New Zealand television. In it, we see a neurosurgeon talking about some of the key porn research and two young porn users talking about their own experience of porn. Adam and Gabe had no problem getting an erection behind a computer. So what was wrong? Could all the porn they've been watching have done something to their brains? Now there's the nerve, you see it right there. Don Helton's been peering inside people's heads for 21 years, a brain surgeon in San Antonio, a world expert on this stuff. I think there's ample evidence that pornography rewires the brain in a very dramatic fashion. Four years ago, Don put forward the controversial theory that internet porn could be as addictive as cocaine. We predicted that based on the way sex causes these reward chemicals in the brain to uh, be produced, that we would see some of the same brain scan findings that we find with drugs. 
and the latest research seems to be proving him right. At Cambridge University, they scanned the brains of 19 compulsive porn users and 19 healthy men while watching explicit internet pornography. Researchers wanted to know what would happen to their reward centres. That's the part of the brain which lights up when we do the things we enjoy, like eating or having sex. It's fueled by packets of dopamine. And they turn it on. And they make that cell say, this is pleasure, this is rewarding. I want this, this feels good. It rewards our brain, it gives us a, a buzz. While the control group got a little buzz from the porn, the reward centres of the porn users lit up like Christmas trees, just like the scans of cocaine addicts. They wanted more, and they wanted it now. An individual that's addicted to porn, just as one that's addicted to cocaine, experiences a, a, a sensitization or an overshoot. And when they see a cue for uh, cocaine or porn, then their brain over-responds, as opposed to someone that is not addicted. I never considered myself addicted back in the day, but now I can clearly see that, yes, I was an addict. I was constantly craving porn, I was turning down real-life sexual opportunities, and I eventually got to the point where I was dependent on porn to function normally. There are still academics out there who say there's no such thing as porn addiction. It's just people with high libidos doing their thing. Do you think that porn addiction has been proven beyond doubt? To me, the proof has been there for several years. The study out of Germany, it showed that... There and last year, more supporting evidence. The Max Planck Institute in Germany identified two physical changes in the brains of internet porn users. First, a rewiring of the frontal lobe, the part of the brain that tells us to stop overindulging, our braking system. It's essentially wearing out of the braking system. It's impeding the signal from the brake to the reward center. So the brake doesn't work as well. So you're driving your car towards porn heaven and the brakes are just aren't working. You've, you've worn out the brake pads. The second and most stunning neurological discovery that high-speed internet porn might actually shrink the brain. This change in volume, the shrinkage in this reward area, was more pronounced the more hours per week the person watched pornography. And that means less grey matter in the part of the brain associated with decision making and motivation. It makes sense of Adam's symptoms. Complete lack of motivation for anything in life. Um, apart from porn. Yeah, apart from porn. There's a third aspect of this emerging science which is even more worrying from a social point of view. The more porn you watch, the more extreme your brain wants it to be. Something that I would have been incredibly fascinated at age 12 was just having no response in my brain at that time, so I had to seek out uh, how to hit. So he needs more. The same porn isn't going to do it. It's going to require a bigger kick. It started out very softcore, you know, with uh, me Googling body parts, right? And then it would escalate to, um, you know, a couple guys, one girl, or gang bangs. And then it got, it kind of, you know, varied what I would watch. And I would search for things that were shocking or that created anxiety, um, like very abusive and misogynistic stuff. But why would our brains do that to us? Novelty. Novelty. Our brains want to learn something new. We're always trying to learn something new. It's what we, it's what we do. Our brains want to learn. And we need new. And new is aggression. New is younger. So, as the video says, some academics deny porn addiction exists. It's taken a while for the official diagnostic manuals to produce a classification. Hypersexual disorder did not make it into the DSM-5 published in 2013, but an equivalent was included in the World Health Organization's International Classification of Diseases Revision 11 in 2018 under a new title of Compulsive Sexual Behaviour Disorder, or CSBD. Now, I should say that the ICD-11 
is the more senior and more commonly used of the two manuals worldwide. Now, there was a lot of heavy lobbying by the porn industry and their supporters to the World Health Organization to keep the term pornography addiction or addictive disorder out of the new ICD-11. So it became classified as compulsive sexual behavior disorder under the parent title of impulse control disorder. And according to various research papers, over 80% of patients seeking treatment for compulsive sexual behavior disorder report out of control pornography use. Now, in this slide, you'll see that while gambling and gaming disorders were included as disorders due to addictive behaviors, as well as impulse control disorder, pornography wasn't, but only classified as an impulse control disorder. This anomaly really irked many clinicians and neuroscience researchers who believed that pornography should have been classified as an addictive disorder too. So these experts have said that problematic pornography use can in fact be diagnosed as an addictive disorder, but under other specified disorders due to addictive behaviors. Now, nomenclature can be important. This is less of an issue in Scotland where we have the free national health service, but it is an issue where people have to pay for health care. Current trends in the literature on out of control sexual behaviors use the term problematic pornography use or PPU, which is regarded as a subtype of sexual addiction, hypersexual disorder or compulsive sexual behavior disorder, rather than as an independent clinical condition. I should say that someone with a porn addiction might have been classified in the past under the heading sex addiction. The current trend also assumes that many patients presenting with sex addiction, hypersexual disorder, compulsive sexual um, behavior disorder will show PPU as a primary problematic sexual behavior. So going forward, we'll use the term PPU. The important thing is PPU can be treated no matter what genetic characteristics a person may have. Physical change in the brain caused by PPU can be reversed through sustained abstinence. The brain has an amazing ability to change and heal itself due to neuroplasticity. So here in this slide, we see a review of cognitive processes and problematic pornography use. It's estimated that between 0.8% and 8% of pornography users display signs and symptoms of problematic pornography use. And in this new review, 21 studies of cognitive processes, researchers found four characteristics related to PPU. First, attentional biases towards sexual stimuli. Given the chance to look at work or porn, the bias would be towards porn. Second, deficient inhibitory control, in particular to problems with motor response inhibition and to shift attention away from irrelevant uh, stimuli. They can't concentrate, they have porn fantasies and thinking about next time they can use porn. Third, there was worse performance in tasks associated with working memory. And lastly, decision-making impairments, in particular, preferences for short-term small gains rather than long-term gains and more impulsive choice patterns compared to non-erotica users, approach tendencies towards sexual stimuli and inaccuracies when judging the probability and magnitude of potential outcomes under ambiguity. Now, there are certain groups who are more vulnerable to PPU and these are adolescents because of their stage of brain development. And they're conditioning their brains with higher levels of sexual stimulation compared to young people who don't use pornography or don't use it too often. It affects the imprinting of their sexual arousal template. People with autism spectrum disorders are vulnerable due to characteristic features of their brain function. Autism is a neurological condition present from birth and affects around one to 1.8% of the population. In research done on young people, by on young sexual offenders rather, people with ASD and other special learning needs were disproportionately represented in crime statistics, particularly for child and child sexual abuse. 
Also, sex therapists and anti-child abuse charities are seeing greater numbers of adults with autism spectrum disorders, often undiagnosed until then, who are seeking treatment in relation to offences for downloading indecent images of children. People with um, ADHD, another neurodevelopmental disorder, are also very prone to PPU. And people with additional learning needs because they, are, they have sexual desires, but they're often treated as if they're asexual and receive little or no sex education. Now, if you're interested in this area, I did a talk for last year's Nicosi Summit on this very topic, and it's available on the Reward Foundation YouTube channel. So how does all this porn affect attitudes and behaviours today? Well, social science research has shown the following negative outcomes with porn use. One, objectification of others, mainly women. It involves seeing body parts as sexual objects, not the whole person with feelings. And such a process of dehumanizing a person makes violence against them much more acceptable. Paul Wright's meta-analysis from 2016 suggests that increased sexual aggression occurs in both males and females after prolonged exposure to pornography. And acceptance of victimization by female users increases over time with exposure to predominantly sexually aggressive pornography against women, increasing a female's normalizing of such behavior. Now we're seeing much more reporting of sexual harassment and sexual assault than before, there may be many reasons for that, but pornography is certainly a major contributory factor. So let's have a look at what some of the legal risks are in regard to PPU. Downloading indecent images of children. Is that indicative of paedophilia, which is strong persistent sexual interest by adults in prepubescent children, or of hebophilia, strong persistent sexual interest by adults in pubescent children who are in early adolescence, typically aged 11 to 14. Some experts believe the two are not the same, though there may be overlap in some cases. Sexual abuse of children, acting out with family members, contact offending. The prevalence of paedophilia is thought to be around 1% of the population. Now, sexual assault on adults it's a steady increase in recent years, and that may be due to more reporting. Rape, very controversial area because rape crisis centres are seeing a huge rise in reports of rape, but only around 3% reach trial in England and Wales and similar figures in Scotland. Prosecution services say that cutbacks by the UK government mean they don't have enough resources to investigate and prosecute. Fatal and non-fatal sexual strangulation. Now this is a very worrying trend and I'll focus on that in some of the coming slides. We're also seeing sexual homicide in such trials in my experience of the criminal courts is that there is never any mention of pornography use in the evidence, but it's undoubtedly a factor in most, if not all such cases. Now, the next slide here, we're seeing some statistics in Scotland. Now, remember, Scotland has a population of around five and a half million people. Sexual assault accounted for 37% of sexual crimes in 2019 to 20, and that was down 4% from the previous year. Sexual strangulation is most likely counted within this category, and we'll see more about that in just a moment. Rape and attempted rape accounted for 18% of sexual crimes, a 3% decrease in the previous year. Sexual homicides, where the main method of killing was strangulation or asphyxiation. The numbers are low, between three and six, in each of the years from 2015 to 2020, and between zero and four males in the same period. And I predict we can expect to see those rates rise in the coming years. It also depends a little bit on how the police actually categorise some of these crimes. 
sexual crime, the non-cyber enabled type, the median age is 36. Now, the two areas I want to focus on now are CSAM, so child sex abuse material, and sexual strangulation. Now, we learned from the great work done by Lila Micklewaite and a recent government inquiry in Canada that MindGeek knowingly put child abuse material on their websites for profit. If a porn user shows an interest in teens, the algorithms will keep pushing edgier material to the user, which most find hard to resist. Now, as users binge more and more, their brains rewire to need higher levels of stimulation. And that can mean a search for younger people. Addiction-related brain changes drive escalation to illegal material too, and they can find it via virtual private networks or on the dark web. Now, the challenge for police is quite considerable. And in this um, excerpt from a newspaper headline, Scots cops arrest 100 suspected paedophiles in six months as part of crackdown. Now, following up and checking offenders' activities and internet devices is very heavy on the police and social work resources. The important but controversial question we need to ask ourselves is, are people who look at indecent images of children the same as real paedophiles, or are they just porn addicts who have escalated? Now, a paedophile is someone with a paedophilic disorder. That is a psychiatric disorder in which an adult or older adolescent experiences a primary or exclusive sexual attraction to prepubescence. Now, most people have accessed indecent images of children have offended, but is the risk to the public the same when they're not a contact offender? Should the treatment be the same? Being charged with possession of indecent images of children causes devastation to families and individuals for years. And there are high levels of suicide amongst the men after being arrested. Now, bear in mind that people with an autism spectrum disorder are disproportionately represented in the crime statistics for indecent images of children. They are likely more attracted to the internet than your average person because they understand and respond to internet systems better. Sadly, there are currently no risk assessment tools available for specifically autistic porn addicts. Now, the question for the police and society is, is there a risk of someone advancing to contact offending? Well, generally, they are considered at very low risk of repeat offending, even with indecent images. So the risk of advancing to contact offending is probably very low. Yet, they are placed on the sex offender register and treated by the same system as full-blown paedophiles, contact offenders who are a serious risk to children and young people. And if there is a real distinction to be drawn, and in my limited experience of people who fall into this category, there is, then there's a desperate need for research to be done in this area and for a risk assessment tool to be developed. The next main criminal area I want to look at is sexual strangulation. In this slide, we see some recent cases in the UK. Sarah Everard was killed by compression of the neck by a policeman who recently pleaded guilty to her abduction, rape and murder. Grace Mullane was a young British backpacker in New Zealand. Her murderer told Tinder dates he liked strangulation. Now, this is a challenging area for healthcare and criminal justice professionals for reasons we'll explore. A few years ago, while doing a presentation to a group of young people, one 14-year-old girl boasted that she was into kink. Now, kink is also called BDSM, meaning bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism. Well, how popular is that? According to a survey by the Sunday Times in 2019 called How Internet Pornography is Changing the Way We Have Sex, twice as many young women, so 38%, as young men, 19%, in Gen Z, that is the under 22 year olds, rated rough sex as their favorite genre of porn. And about half as many singled out BDSM as the preferred porn genre. As shown in this second graph from the same survey, cutting across all age groups, the younger people are the more they seem to like BDSM and rough sex. That is 42% of Gen Z, 
29% of 23 to 38 year olds nominated rough sex as a favorite. Now experts believe the film Fifty Shades of Grey has been hugely influ influential in making practices such as choking, i.e. sexual strangulation, go mainstream. Now the pornography in industry has renamed choking as airplay or breath play to make it sound like fun, but it is sexual strangulation. And it can be anything but fun as research from 2021 by Dr. Bichard and others has found out. In a paper called The Neuropsychological Outcomes of Non-Fatal Strangulation in Domestic and Sexual Violence, a Systematic Review, the findings are truly alarming. The paper reviews the neurological, cognitive, psychological and behavioural outcomes of non-fatal strangulation. And I've been told by a police officer that this is one of the fastest growing areas of crime, so it is likely to lead to more fatalities as a result. The lead author of this paper identified a range of injuries caused by non-fatal strangulation that can include cardiac arrest, stroke, miscarriage, incontinence, speech disorders, seizures, paralysis and other forms of long-term brain injury. She said that the injuries may not be visible to the naked eye or may only become evident hours or days after the attack meaning that they are far less obvious than injuries like wounds or broken bones, and so may be missed during a police investigation. I'm going to read some excerpts from the paper. Brain injury within domestic and sexual violence is belatedly gaining academic, medical and legal attention. This is welcome given the scale of the problem. More than one in three women are victims of intimate partner violence. 44% report sexual assault and 20% rape. In the majority of sexual assaults, the perpetrator is the victim's partner. So there is a significant overlap between the two areas termed intimate partner sexual violence. The paper goes on, within this new field, the research emphasis has been on traumatic brain injury. However, strangulation has emerged as a hidden epidemic. The incidence is high. In a US study of IPV or sexual assault health encounters, strangulation was reported in 23% of the assaults. A similar UK audit noted strangulation in one in five cases presenting at a sexual assault referral center. An interesting fact is that it can take more pressure to open a canned drink than to block the jugular vein. Now, in addition to the neurological damage leading to possible cognitive and behavioral changes, there is also the risk of significant psychological trauma. Strangulation has been called the edge of homicide. If a woman has been strangled by her partner, for her, the future risk of attempted murder increases sevenfold and the death by a factor of eight. Strangulation is a uniquely intimate act of terrorism. The systematic review highlights that these women are unlikely to present to healthcare services despite the severity of their injuries. The paper also usefully touches on the very important issue for the criminal justice system, namely consent, but from a neuropsychological perspective. Cognitively, consent hinges on two factors. It must be informed, and there needs to be capacity to withdraw it at any point. If strangulation, so its mechanics and its severity, is not understood, then the victim is not informed. The potential onset of dyspraxia, amnesia, and unconsciousness itself in as little as four seconds are disabling the very organ that is needed to withdraw consent. And consent is compromised by the activity to which that consent applies. The term consenting kink is therefore a potentially fatal misnomer. This is worrying in the context of strangulation, having become normalised. In a recent UK survey of 2002 participants, 38% of women under 40 had experienced strangulation during sex, with 42% of those saying it was unwanted and that they had felt pressured, coerced or forced. That was from work done by the BBC in 2019. This can happen in same-sex relationships too. 
Sadly, the young woman we spoke to who thought she was being so edgy engaging with kink might well end up on a mortuary slab somewhere, ignorant of the real risks around this very dangerous practice. Is that what happened to Grace Mullane? The question is, what's to be done? In the Reward Foundation, we have three recommendations. As with all problematic behaviour, a user has to stop hammering their brain with the noxious stimulus. So we recommend that porn users with problematic use, one, take the glass out of the wound. In other words, remove the stressor. And abstinence rather than harm reduction is the model that's preferred. Two, tame the mind. In other words, gain control of thoughts and fantasies. Rumination reinforces the brain pathways and makes it more difficult to give up. Three, learn how to connect with others in real life. Rewire the brain to healthier activities. And there are more details about this on our website. For more information on the brain, I'd recommend that you have a look at this book, Your Brain on Porn, Internet Pornography and the Emerging Signs of Addiction. It's an update on a popular TEDx talk, The Great Porn Experiment, by the sadly now departed Gary Wilson. Since the talk was given in Glasgow in 2012, it has had over 14 million views. The website, yourbrainonporn.com, has all the good research and good articles that you might want. It has thousands of recovery stories. The book is very accessible and was written by a very good science teacher. It's available as a paperback, as an ebook, as an audiobook, and it's available in a variety of languages. English, obviously, but also Arabic, Russian, Japanese, German, Dutch, Hungarian, and others are in the pipeline. The Reward Foundation has a free lesson plan called The Great Porn Experiment, available on our website, and is based on the TED Talk and includes up to date statistics on it. And here are some recovery websites. And they offer information on how to get over PPU. Also, the Reward Foundation has a free parent's guide to internet pornography too, with an abundance of resources on how to speak to your child about pornography and educate yourself about the risks. And it's available on our homepage. I hope this information will be helpful to you in both understanding the serious crime risks around problematic porn use and the fact that there is hope for users through the range of recovery websites and tools available. We need to be led by education, not fear, to tackle this hidden epidemic. Thank you for your attention.